An alliance representing more than one-fourth of the world's economy, the BRICS bloc has now doubled its number and is set to expand further. So what's drawing these countries together? And can BRICS offer a counterbalance to the existing world order? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Hashim Mahal Barra. Russia is set to host its biggest foreign policy event ever. Leaders representing more than 40% of the world's population are assembling in the southwestern city of Kazan. The 16th BRICS summit will have five new members, doubling the group's strength to 10. Leaders from several other countries are also attending. Some of them, like Turkey and Malaysia, have already applied to join the growing alliance. The event gives President Vladimir Putin an opportunity to signal to the West that he has not been isolated because of the war in Ukraine. It's also an occasion for other member states to amplify their voices and policies. So what's behind the rapid expansion of this bloc and can it become a challenge to the existing global order? We'll get to our guests in a moment, but first, this report from Um Kulsoum Sharif. The Russian city of Kazan is preparing to host the 16th annual BRICS summit. It's the bloc's first meeting with five new members, as it doubles its membership to 10 in less than two decades of its existence. Many say its expansion shows its growing global importance. BRICS is the, is the voice of the global south, uh, global south in these multilateral platforms um, where the West dominate. Really, BRICS can take us out of that. BRICS was set up in 2006 with a desire to be a geopolitical counterweight to the West. Brazil, Russia, China and India were the founding members. Since then, it's expanded to include South Africa in 2010 and Egypt, Iran, Ethiopia, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates were invited to join the bloc last year. While Riyadh is yet to formally confirm, several other countries have applied for membership. The beauty of BRICS is that it doesn't put, you, put too many obligations on you, right? There are not that many strings attached really for being part of the BRICS. And at the same time, there might be interesting opportunities coming your way, including just having more face time with all of these leaders. The meeting comes at a time when Russia is stepping up its attacks in Ukraine and while President Vladimir Putin faces an arrest warrant for war crimes issued by the International Criminal Court last year. When Moscow wants to present the summit as evidence that Western efforts to isolate it have failed. Ahead of the summit, Putin said BRICS and not the West will drive global economic growth. The total GDP of the BRICS Association is more than 60 trillion, and the total share of the global gross product confidently exceeds that of the so-called G7 countries, and it continues to grow. Russia also wants other countries to work with it to overall the global financial system and end the dominance of the U.S. dollar. BRICS is perceived as an alternative to the dollar system. It offers some alternative ways of carrying out economic and financial transactions. Russia proposes to use some kind of new currency, which could allow national currencies to be converted into a new unit of payment. It will reportedly be digital money. Putin has also invited Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas to the summit, where Israel's war on Gaza is expected to be discussed. The Russian leader has reaffirmed his government's support for a two-state solution. Umm Sharif, Al Jazeera, for Inside Story. Let's bring in our guests in Moscow. Andrei Fedorov, former Deputy Foreign Minister of Russia. In Tehran, Hassan Ahmadian, professor at the University of Tehran who specializes in Iranian foreign policy. In Hereford, in the UK, Mark Seddon, director of the Center for United Nations Studies at the University of Buckingham and was a veteran UN correspondent. Welcome to the program. Andrei, is it the sense in Russia 
that BRICS has all it takes to become a key geopolitical player? I would like to say that in Moscow by Russian President Putin, uh, this summit of uh, BRICS is considering as a turning point towards creation of multipolar world. Of course, uh, the uh, idea to make BRICS as a serious political player is important, but at the same time, it's a contradiction uh, with its original goal to make it effective economic mechanism. And there is a situation when uh, some of the countries like India are against so-called mechanical enlargement of BRICS, uh, being afraid that uh, its political side of BRICS will be prevailing. So that's why it's very important to find that this uh, summit coming summit balance between political interests and economic realities. Hassan, uh, it, when you listen to Iranian officials over the last few years, they've been always saying that we need something that could serve as a counterweight to the dominance of the Western uh, key players and the Americans. Could this moment be the moment that the Iranians have been waiting for for many years? I think that's exactly what the Iranians are speaking of, looking at BRICS as a uh, organization outside the U.S. sphere of influence and its domination. And that gives it strategic uh, weight in Iran's thinking. Uh, it gives Iran opportunities, the potential that it carries economically, politically, and uh, uh, financially, gives Iran opportunities to break out of the box that the United States has been trying with its Western allies to box Iran in. Uh, uh, so the, the reality that the organization is out of the uh, 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 domination of the United States, it's uh, beyond the U.S., so-called U.S.-led world order, uh, is of strategic importance to Tehran. And the Iranians have been vocal about it on an official level. They have been trying to seize uh, this opportunity and the different layers that it provides Iran with, be it economic, financial, and uh, politically, uh, as a way of channeling their uh, policies uh, and, and with regards to uh, the BRICS states, but also with regards to other issues of uh, importance to Iran and its foreign policy, be it the Middle East or other regions. Uh, they have been also using the podium and uh, political capacity that it provides to uh, their priorities as well. Mark, you've spent many years covering the UN. Now you ask people in this part of the world, in particular about the US, they will tell you the, uh, their bias is more pronounced than ever. You would ask them about the UN, they will tell you one of the most inefficient organizations in the world. Could this perception serve as a a trigger for many countries to say, you know what, in BRICS we could have a genuine alternative to a failing international world order. Well, yes, I mean, I, I, obviously I covered the UN as a journalist, but I also work for Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, so I've been fortunate enough really to see things on, on both sides. And I think it's not too difficult to see right now that the paralysis in the UN Security Council, uh, principally over Israel right now, and uh, the these the ceasefire motions that have kept have been vetoed repeatedly by uh, the, US, the United States, and of course the also the Russia-Ukraine war. All of these issues have paralysed the UN. So it's not necessarily the UN's fault. Uh, it's the it's the fault of the member states. That saying, I mean, I think that the many countries in the West don't quite appreciate how they are currently viewed in the global South. Uh, and that this paralysis at the UN also feeds through to this perception that really um, Western countries are being incredibly hypocritical, on the one hand calling for Russia to end its war in Ukraine, but at the, on the other hand to continue supplying Israel with all the weapons it may wish for what is clearly a genocide in the Palestinian territory. So, I mean, there, I looked at the West, the British press this morning. There's very little mention of BRICS, but that does show you something of the uh, the way in which Western media tends to be very inward looking. Uh, but to my mind, it needs to wake up because there is a reaction against this idea of a unipolar world uh, and the global south 
uh, is, is fed up of being lectured to, um, and it wants to have its own organisations, and good luck to it. Andre, the many people all over the world are frustrated with the world order, but yet they are to see BRICS achieve what they're hoping to see happen in the near future. Could you give me an idea about what could be the first issue that BRICS should tackle and succeed in bringing about a tangible result for people to start finally say, we trust BRICS? Uh, first of all, uh, BRICS should solve uh, serious economic problems in this modern world. It's uh, problems of equal trade, issue of sanctions, and many other things. If BRICS will be capable to do something in economic life, for example, in the future to create not maybe all own currency, but own economic uh, financial system, uh, which will be stable uh, for our, from outside world interference. It could uh, uh, lead also to growing political influence of BRICS. So um, uh, economic issues should be on the front page of BRICS uh, in the coming future. Without it, nothing will be done. Hassan, for the Iranians who face huge geopolitical challenges uh, these days with the Americans, with the Israelis, their allies in the region have been suffering major setbacks. Could BRICS serve as a key ally that could stand with Iran if it faces more and more challenges, particularly against the backdrop of the uh, Israeli response? The uh, Western-dominated organizations that, uh, as, as previous speakers have pointed out, have been very hypocritical when it comes to issues uh, in the region, including when it comes to Iran. Uh, and uh, they, they uh, deal with the other issues that are more linked to their security differently, such as the Ukrainian issue. So for the Iranians, having been uh, uh, at the receiving end of uh, uh, U.S. sanctions, unilateral sanctions, as opposed to a uh, international uh, sanctions that existed before the nuclear deal, uh, Iran is fed up with this uh, U.S.-led so-called world order, and uh, it's, it's seeking any opportunity. And obviously, the BRICS provides a big opportunity for Iran to uh, deal with issues that the United States and the West, collective West, has try have tried to push Iran out of. For the Iranians, it's it's important to uh, look at the uh, uh, the potentialities that this organization uh, is this organization brings about. Uh, also, it's important uh, uh, to see the opportunities that are provided by it economically and financially, uh, taking sanctions into account. Also, it's important to look at it from a security perspective, uh, knowing that the United States has been supporting uh, uh, a full-fledged war by the Israelis on Gaza and Lebanon and potentially uh, attacks on Iran. The Iranians also uh, look at uh, organizations such as the BRICS to balance off that unilaterally, the unilaterality, unilaterality that the United States is basically uh, uh, infusing the world system. Mark, uh, isn't it's a little bit naive to think that BRICS could become a genuine voice of the voiceless when you have two key members of this alliance, the Russians and the Chinese, obviously seeing this as a tool to expand their geopolitical leverage. Well, that may be, but I, but I also noticed that BRICS is attracting lots of uh, new member countries. Lots of countries want to join it. I think there does seem to be uh, a desire also to look beyond the kind of... Uh, Free market hyperliberalism of the uh, of the of the American and the British, the Anglo-American capitalistic model, if you like. I mean, it's just not working. Um, so there's that. Uh, there's the economic alternative that's coming, uh, and especially from the global south, for the from the emerging powers, Brazil, South Africa, and others. But also, I think it. You know, you've got to also look at what's happening in the in the what people loosely call the West. I mean, it's quite possible we may have a Trump presidency in a month's time, which will, of course, alarm an awful lot of the European governments. 
Um, I don't think that many of the European governments, I mean, it's almost going back slightly to what I was saying before, but can quite appreciate how isolated they have become, have made themselves become, because of their stance principally over what is happening in Gaza and also now in Lebanon. Um, and, and so this, this constant support for whatever American foreign and defence policy may dictate is not helping them at all. Uh, and mm. so there is this reaction, I think, against a unipolar world, very much. Uh, Andre, you, you spoke about uh, the, the economic factor as a, de as a defining issue for Brexit. Do you think that the proposal by the Russians to start with a grain trading exchange as the first step that, if successful, it could convince people to move forward towards putting together more financial mechanisms that could serve as alternative to the similar organizations such as the, uh, the International Monetary Fund? Yes, it's one of the goals, and Russia is supporting this idea to have uh, within BRICS own stable financial system, which uh, cannot be uh, disturbed by any sanctions, by, uh, by any uh, foreign interference, and um, which can uh, really uh, develop, first of all, trade with the use of local currencies, of national currencies, without using of U.S. dollar. Uh, it's a a long process. Uh, don't expect that it will happen overnight. Uh, but this process uh, is on the way. Hassan, when it comes to the Middle East in particular, members do not really see eye to eye when it comes to how to move forward. Could BRICS today become a tool to enforce, for example, ceasefire in the region, could influence geopolitical decisions, could put an end to the instability, or is it a long way to go before we get to that point? I think it's a long way. Uh, basically, the BRICS is not a monolith, obviously. There are countries with close ties to the West, parties to the BRICS, but there are those uh, rising powers, and there are those who are sanctioned. Uh, there are these. This group basically is uh, uh, the, the 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 party that is pushing for a parallel uh, mechanism to deal with crises. That includes Russia, Iran, and to a large extent China. Uh, um, others don't want maybe to risk their relations in uh, you know uh, getting so close to the. Uh, 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 you know, the, the idea of a parallel order. But these countries have a common view on how uh, things should change in not only the Middle East, but around the world. In the Middle East, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the so-called rules-based system did not work. If anything, the main pillars of it, namely the United States and the West, the West that established it, have helped and aided Israel in its, uh, in its atrocities uh, uh, in Gaza, in Lebanon, and elsewhere in the region. And uh, no matter what they did, what the Israelis did, they, they kept receiving what they needed to do what they were doing, and still they are doing. So, so that, that is, is uh, something that is uh, uh, not working, basically. Uh, these countries are thinking about something parallel that can change mm -hmm. the equation, change many of the uh, parameters that have blocked the effectiveness of the international system. And I think that's a huge goal that cannot happen very easily. It's not a short-term goal. There are huge challenges. There mm -hmm. is the, uh, the, 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 the the competition between the collective West and the BRICS mm -hmm. as well that will we will see more unfolding in, in the future. So there are lots of challenges, but steps have been taken. And I think uh, it's moving ahead. Mark, yes, you talk to people and they will tell you that the UN's veto power is not fairly utilised. It's there just to advance the agenda of the powerful countries, that the Security Council has never been genuine about the need to change things on the ground. But yet you get a sense that these are mechanisms that can operate. When it comes to BRICS, you don't really get a sense of clarity about the tools they have to have to implement new realities on the ground that if they decide tomorrow, let's solve this particular problem, how can we do it? 
Well, I, I can I can see that amongst many member many BRICS member states, there's also a commonality of view about what needs to happen with the United Nations. It's not power of the veto per se, it's how it's being abused. And I have to say that over the past two to three years, um, Russia has used the veto a great deal. America has used the veto a great deal. America has been backed up uh, by my country, Britain. Um, I think if the if BRICS countries can come together and push for the desperately needed UN reform, then the BRICS are certainly onto something. Um, because not only are many BRICS member states talking about a, a different world economic order, but once they start talking about a different political and security order, we're onto something in many, many ways. And I think that UN reform is key. The fact, for instance, that there's no African member state that is a mem permanent member of the Security mm -hmm. Council. It's the same for Latin America. We, we know how it looks and what has got to change. The UN is fixed as it was in 1945 uh, with the defeat of Nazi Germany. Well, mm -hmm. it's time for change. And I think that we're increasingly seeing much stronger and, and actually empowered voices. And most certainly what we're seeing in the Middle East, more than anything, is empowering people. And by the way, I think when it comes to the general public, in, especially in Europe, mm -hmm. they take a very different view over many of these issues to, to, than their governments. And so this idea that just because the Western press is not interested in reporting on BRICS, that somehow people in my country are not uh, happy to see uh, members of the Global South and other countries coming together and, and actually challenging some of these Western nostrums, I think, I think a lot of people do support them. Andre, this is not the first time that someone came out and said we need to change reality on the ground. The non-alliance movement in the 60s and the 70s appealed to many people because it was widely perceived to be as a challenge to the prevailing world order, but it failed because some of its ideas were so far-fetched. How can you maintain BRICS attractive when ultimately you don't have a bank, you don't have a currency, you don't have a common fund, you don't have a sense of unity that could you could sell to the people? Uh, first of all, I would like to say that BRICS will never be a replacement for the United Nations. Mm -hmm. And I fully agree that BRICS can influence on uh, the possible reform within the United Nations, uh, especially concerning a security uh, council. Uh, uh, but as I said, for BRICS, it's very important to create serious network, real network, which includes financial mechanisms, communication system, system of consultations, and many, many things. BRICS should not be an organization of summits. Uh, BRICS should be an organization of concrete projects, which is still uh, not the case. BRICS needs a number of serious global uh, projects, especially economic projects, to uh, identify itself as effective organization, but not only as a, as I said, uh, organization of summits. Hassan, how do the Iranians see the future of BRICS when it expands? Is it going to be the platform that they have been looking forward to seeing put into place that could respond to some of their grievances, concerns about their position and their place in the, on the global arena? That's definitely is the case for the Iranians, as I said. Uh, you know, the unilateral sanctions, the unilateral actions uh, on the part of the United States and its allies in the region vis-a-vis -vis Iran uh, violating the nuclear deal that was part of the international law because it was ratified by the United Nations uh, uh, Security Council. All of that told the Iranians that, uh, uh, I mean, the, 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 that order has failed Iran. Iranians have been trying to, uh, uh, you know, further their agenda and their policy within that framework to this day, but still they are seeing opportunities coming up as a result of uh, you know the, the other countries uh, facing the same challenges that Iran has faced vis-a-vis -vis the United States and the West, Russia now mm -hmm. is under immense uh, sanctions. Iran is under sanctions. China has seen its share, and I think 
moving forward, we'll see more. Uh, this creates the uh, club of the sanction that is a huge mm -hmm. club and uh, economics, uh, geopolitics, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, other uh, aspects can be uh, dealt with collectively within this framework. But, okay. uh, you know, uh, uh, not to exaggerate it is important because uh, even regional organizations such as the uh, European Union, it took it took four decades for it to have a uh, common currency. And uh, lots of issues uh, are still to be uh, resolved within uh, parties that are members to the BRICS to move to a more coherent vision as to where things should move. But all in all, I think there is this that, that common, rather broad, uh, uh, you know, uh, common vision of, of uh, reforming the UN, uh, tackling issues beyond the West. And I have one last question, if you don't mind, uh, Hassan. Okay, Mark, uh, BRICS resonates among left-leaning governments, particularly in Africa and Latin America. When governments there turn right or conservatives, I don't think they're willing to do anything that could be seen as an affront or a challenge to the Americans. So do you think that this could undermine the chances for BRICS to stand solid in the future? Well, I don't know. I, I, I suspect, you know, you talk about the European Union, um, as, our, as our, our colleague in Tehran was just doing there. I mean, essentially, you've got lots of different uh, political persuasions running European countries. And most countries, apart from, of course, mine, which left, uh, seem to be quite happy to be within the EU. Large <laughs> organisations have got to be constructed, really, to, to be big enough for all of their members and to take account of the different uh, types of government they may have. But there's a commonality of interest. We've talked about some of this when it comes to the United Nations, um, the rule of international law, all of these things that actually came out of the end of the Second World War that our grandparents fought so hard to establish um, are now being sort of ripped uh, uh, ripped up in front of us. And so I think that there are many countries around the world looking for a new kind of stability in terms of peace and security. They don't see necessarily America as an honest broker in the Middle East anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. And they also look at the economic model that we've had for the past 40, 50 years, uh, and also since the collapse of um, of the Soviet Union, and which which generated an even faster a rush to an extreme free market kind of model that does not really suit uh, most Thank countries. You. And so there's a lot of uh, op op uh, opportunities for change, I think. Mark Sidden, Hassan Ahmadian, Andrea Fedorova, really appreciate your insight. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Insight Story. You can also join the conversation or X. Our handle is at AJ Insight Story. From me, Hashem Ahlbara, and the entire team here in Doha. Bye for now. Make sure to subscribe to our channel to get the latest news from Al Jazeera.